I don't know what Paul and Micah have going on, but whatever it is, it needs to stop. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new, welcome to my channel. My name is Stephanie Yates Anya Buile, Steph Anya for short, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Today, I'm gonna to be talking specifically about the three episodes of After the Altar for season four of Love is Blind. If you're curious, stay tuned. I will say all in all, I thought this was a very wholesome after the altar and I preferred it over the ones that we've seen for the last two seasons. The last two seasons, we've had really big reveals happen right before after the altar that pretty much made everything that we saw null and void. So with season two, both Jared and Ayana and I think Nick and Danielle both made their divorce announcements before After the Altar. So it was like, what was the point of watching that? And then in season three, it came out that SK had been cheating on Raven the whole time and that whole big plot point was him proposing to her. So that was pointless. So I think they learned from those two experiences and now they are doing After the Altar after the reunion. It was completely pointless when they were filming it before the reunion because that means we learned up-to-date information before we even saw After the Altar. So what was the point? You know, they use this just as a way to market the next shows they have coming out, which is the next season of Love is Blind, which I will be watching and breaking down for you all. So let's start with episode one. One of the first things that we see is Micah meeting up with Paul's mom for lunch. Now, this is obviously crossing all sorts of boundaries and it's not uncommon. I'm sure many of you know people and maybe you are people who still have a great relationship with your ex's family. There's nothing wrong with having a good relationship with your ex's family, especially if kids are involved, but this is a unique situation in where only Paul and Micah are really involved in this relationship. They don't have any children. They weren't together for years where they have a ton of mutual friends. So at this point, being being in contact with his mother is really just trying to be in contact with him, which she was. The reason clearly played out in the scene that we saw. Why? Because now you're finding out things about your ex that you're not hearing from them and really is not relevant to you. So his mom tells her, From what I understand, Paul is talking to someone. You know, it's like, why did she feel like it was her place to tell her that? When you have these relationships where the lines are so blurred and the boundaries are not clear, you end up taking a lot longer to heal and process the breakup or several relationship. Cause this is not only for romantic relationships, right? Sometimes there are friendships that you may have where you were close with someone's family or maybe you're close with their partner. And even though that friendship is no longer viable, you want to continue on with those other relationships. And in an ideal world, everybody would be mature and you can do this, but typically you need some time to heal before it makes a lot of sense to continue doing that because you really need to restructure that dynamic. Paul's mom is still engaging with Micah as though Micah is going to be his future wife. She's telling her things like, I never saw him smile with anyone the way that he smiles with you. So she has her own agenda, right? She doesn't want Paul or Micah to give up hope on their relationship because she wants them to be together. And so when she's coming in with her agenda, that is going to counteract what I would hope Micah's agenda is, which is to heal, process, and move on. I think it became clear after a while that Micah had hoped that they would be getting back together. And maybe that's why she thought it would make sense to stay in touch with Paul's mom. Maybe thinking that, you know, in the future, she wants to make sure they have a great relationship once they're back together. But if that is not something that's being clearly defined, if both partners are not saying my intention is for us to work on this relationship and be back together, it absolutely makes no sense to stay that close with family members and friends. That's just my take. I'm curious what your takes are. Please be sure to put them in the comments. The other big takeaway I had from episode one is Chelsea admits at the dinner with the other couples who have stayed together that she didn't recognize the sacrifice that Kwame was making. I really appreciated that moment because I think that the way Kwame talked about the sacrifices he was making for the sake of the relationship, for her and for a lot of us, it sounded like he was simply saying that he was giving up the bachelor life to be with her. And I still have my reservations about Chelsea and Kwame, but I really do hope that I'm wrong. My hope in this experiment with any of these shows is that people actually find their lifelong 
love. That piece, that's what they came on the show for, hopefully. So I hope that I'm wrong about that, but it does feel kind of performative when we watch them at times. I'll try not to be too redundant with the videos I already did. I already broke down Chelsea and Kwame's entire relationship from what we saw. But as I said before, Chelsea's very aware of how things are portrayed on camera. She's very aware of the cameras. And I think that a lot of times there's a certain image that she tries to have come across regarding the relationship, that being like playful, teasing, very sexual, and maybe that is really their dynamic. It just comes across as like, that is the look that she's going for specifically. But I appreciated a bit of that vulnerability for her to say that she's for the first time recognizing that the lifestyle sacrifices that Kwame was making wasn't only in regard to his bachelor lifestyle, but just goals that he had for himself in general, like traveling, seeing the world. These are things that he was able to do before getting married. And in addition to not being able to live in the city that he's become comfortable with, which is Portland, where he has community. So I appreciated that moment of transparency and awareness on her end. And I'm not sure if that was the first moment that she recognized that or if it's something that she's been carrying with her for a long time, but hearing the other couples talk about their travels seemed to have really brought that to the forefront for her. And I thought that was like a nice moment to just kind of validate the things that Kwame was trying to communicate prior to the wedding. In the second episode, there are a few takeaways for me, which again, we're looking at that dynamic with Paul and his mom and Micah. Paul and Micah are really struggling with boundaries. They already said in the reunion that they tried to get back together after the experiment and it didn't work out, they broke up. And it seems like based on the fact that a lot of these shots are discussing things that happened on the reunion, Irina referring to Bliss wearing lavender, for example, or Keisha, when she talks to Jackie, she refers to things that were said on the reunion. So I'm assuming this was filmed after the reunion, but it might've been a mix, some things before, some things after. But if they tried to make it work before the reunion, now here we are after the reunion and they're still in contact, Micah's still talking to his mom, there just should be clearer boundaries because I think Micah tends to latch on to people and we'll talk about that in a bit. But Paul, I think, has the insight necessary to know that it doesn't make sense to continue being in contact with Micah at the level that it seems like he is if he does not want to be with her, if he's talking to someone else, like you're talking to her all the time and not mentioning that you're dating. Obviously, that's not a friendship that you're building, right? Because you're lying by omission. And so these things between Micah and Paul, I think are just a perfect example of how even if you have two people who have a lot of love for each other, if they both see each other as good people, that is not enough grounds to try to pursue a friendship after dating because the purpose of creating those boundaries is not as a punishment. That's the problem, is that a lot of us see boundaries as a punishment to another person instead of protection for ourselves. And so if you look at it as a punishment, you think to yourself, well, they're not a bad person. They were good to me, so why should I ice them out? And that's not what it's about. It's giving your nervous system an opportunity to learn how to relax and be stable without that person. Because a lot of times we're trying to keep that person in our lives because they filled a very specific role. Maybe this is the comfort that we needed to see a future with someone. Or maybe this is where we felt the most at home. And even though those are beautiful things, they're not healthy things when you're no longer with that person. So you're creating the boundary to protect yourself and be able to move forward with your life. It's not a punishment to that person. So even if they were awesome and great, it still works to your advantage to make sure you're tending to yourself and giving yourself the distance and space that you need to envision a different future than the one you envisioned with them. Speaking of Keisha, let's talk about the situation with Keisha, Jackie, and Marshall. One of the most frustrating things about After the Altar is that we're introduced to all of these people from the pods that we didn't know anything about and they are the center of the drama. We see this in two different areas that we'll come back to. And so it's a little frustrating because we have no reference of them from previous episodes. You can't really do a character analysis and assess whether or not you think people are being truthful or vindictive. We just don't know because we're just meeting them. First impressions of Keisha, she seems like a, a sweet and kind person. You know, that 
is the first thing that you see. Because I also think it was very interesting and strategic that they had Jackie being the person that was initiating these conversations with her. Because it's kind of like, why would you have two of Marshall's exes talking about Marshall? You know, unless you're just trying to lay the groundwork for some drama. And I think both of them handled it in a way that wasn't too catty, even though they did both talk about blocking him. Keisha for a good reason. I think Keisha blocked him for the same reason I was just talking about, right? Establishing boundaries for yourself just so that you can move forward and not be factoring this person into your present or future. I don't think she was saying he was a bad guy. She just didn't need him to continuously apologize to her because obviously as the person keeps reaching out and engaging with you, now your mind in some way is going to be focused on this person, even if it's just only for the sake of the conversation that you're having with them. So I don't blame her for blocking him. I hope she communicated to him that she didn't want to talk with him. You guys know I'm not a big fan of ghosting people, especially people who have the capability to understand why you wouldn't want to talk to them. Yeah, I feel like if you can, try to give people a chance to understand why. They can learn it for their next relationship and it's good practice for you in communicating boundaries. So I hope that she did at least tell him I don't think it makes sense for us to still be in contact. On my end, I'm going to be blocking you. Feel free to block me as well. If you think that's the best fit for you, just so that we can both move forward with our lives, I don't think there would be a problem with that. But Keisha is essentially saying that Marshall was diminishing or minimizing the relationship that they had after he was with Jackie. Because Marshall in the reunion says that they just had a single date. And Keisha is saying, he's just saying it like we had a single date, but he was telling me, you know, if I would have been with you, then we would have been married by now. Do I think that means Marshall was lying? Hey, maybe there is more to the story that we don't know. Like maybe something they're not saying is maybe they slept together or maybe they hung out at each other's places a lot, but they only one had one date. But just based on what we heard, I still think they both could be telling the truth. I mean, to Marshall, maybe it was just a date. Even if he was saying things like, if I would have picked you, this process would have gone differently. We probably would have been married. I don't know if that necessarily means he was in love with her since ultimately it sounds like he's the one who ended things, hence why he felt the need to keep apologizing. But maybe Keisha was interpreting that as if it was like a Zach and Bliss situation. Like he was telling her she's the one that got away when maybe he was just saying, you would have been a better fit for me with this experiment. I don't know. We don't know how those conversations went, but I wouldn't take Keisha saying that him saying that means that he was completely minimizing the relationship. If to him it boiled down to a single date and maybe he was telling her those things before they went on the date and then maybe after the date he realized like there was no future with them or that he still needed to heal, which I respect because you don't want to just jump into a relationship out of revenge or trying to quickly soothe your ego because you're hurt and you've been rejected. So if he felt like he wasn't in a place where it makes sense to move forward with her, I respect that. I also will use this as an opportunity to talk about Marshall does have a new girlfriend, but again, it's just a thing where you just really don't know the dynamics because these are people that are being introduced to us for the first time. All I can say is that I'm happy he has someone that he seems to be happy with. Do I think he was probably going a little hard to sell us on the fact that he was happy? Sure. But I think a lot of us would be in that predicament if we felt like the world was turning on us or that the person we wanted to be with made us look stupid and embarrassed. I, I can say probably quite a few of us would go the route of trying to look as happy as possible just to prove people wrong. So I don't judge him for that. But I don't really have much to say about that new relationship because we just didn't see a lot. It was one Scene, right we'll see what happens but I'm hoping the best for them but as far as the situation with Marshall and Keisha I just still don't think we have enough information I think that it's possible that they're both telling the truth to Keisha maybe he was saying a little bit more than he was letting on and maybe to Marshall it wasn't that serious because it was one date and it was just more of a situation of him saying this experiment would have gone a lot better or I would have been a lot less hurt had I went with you instead of Jackie. Both of those things are true. So let's talk a little bit about Chelsea and Kwame and the Joloff story. I loved that story as Kwame shared about his first experience with Joloff and realizing at the airport that this was his mother. I loved learning that bit of backstory and I think it kind of makes sense why Kwame has somewhat of a floating identity. That kind of disruption from your primary attachment figure, I think it takes a lot more to find yourself and feel grounded and comforted in people and in community and so I think that actually explains a lot to me. It was nice to see Kwame's family and Chelsea's family sharing dinner. 
I don't get the impression that this happens often. That probably was the first time that ever happened. So again, it seems like the type of thing that's being purposely scheduled and set up for camera because it didn't seem like there was a relationship between Kwame's sister and Chelsea's family already established. A lot of these were kind of introductory stories. And so again, it makes me question sometimes, like what is the purpose? Like this was something that was purposely scheduled. I don't know if it was on the producer's end, if it was Chelsea or Kwame's idea, but I know they did that because of the issues surrounding Kwame's mom and her lack of agreement with this process, not coming to the wedding. I think it would have been a lot more powerful if Kwame's mom was there just to have the sister and brother there, you know, we'd already seen them before. So it was nothing to me that gave us like a happily ever after, and maybe that's what they thought it would give us, but you know, it was more people that we've already seen. And again, to me, it was like kind of a staged dinner meetup thing. So it wasn't exactly like a heartwarming thing for me to see, but I absolutely did love that story about Joloff and it gave me a lot more understanding about Kwame. Again, I'm none of these people's therapists. So this is just based on what we're seeing on an edited TV show. So it's not that I have the utmost understanding and perspective, but it did remind me at least of some clients that I work with. So here's the confusing thing with Jackie and Josh. Were they really living together this whole time or not? Because at the reunion, they made it seem as though they were already living together, right? And that they've been together for a year. Then here at After the Altar, like what is the timeline? Because we're seeing them move together. Are they moving in for the first time? Because in the first couple of scenes, that seems like that's what was insinuated. But then as they were moving in, it seemed like they were just moving from an old place to a newer place. My guess is that they were moving in together for the first time because Jackie even said when they were in the Ferris wheel in the first episode that you know, I'm excited for us to like move into like our first apartment yeah. because a lot of people said that they're not going to work out. They were praying on our downfall. Nobody expected us to stay together. So I'm just really excited for us to move in together to just prove people wrong kind of thing. And that's why I say one year means nothing to me because for one year, your entire motivation in your relationship could be to prove people wrong. Two years it could be. Usually it's after two years where you can kind of see a little bit more into who this person is. Now that's not to say you can't learn a lot about a person in a few months, but it is a challenge. It is a challenge because there's really only so much building your connection and learning about the relationship outside of you that you can do in that period of time as working adults. You only get so many hours together. So I think that Jackie and Josh, it's still to be seen where their relationship is going to go. Hearing Josh say things like, we don't need a ring to define our relationship, yet y'all came on a show, which insinuates that you were both interested in marriage and ready for marriage, to me, is a red flag, because were you ready for marriage or not? I am one of those people who can appreciate someone taking it at their own pace, but again, you know, if you guys have been together for a year, you went through the pod process, like three of these other couples who are married, and you're still not clear on whether or not you want to be married to each other, I think that is cause for question. And the last thing I have to say about episode two, we are finally getting to the flag football game, which I thought was really cute. And I think with Zach and Bliss, you can see that they are very much above the drama. I love Bliss so much. And I love again, how Zach handled the whole situation with the receipts that we talked about in their video. But this I think was a very wholesome thing. Cause the great thing about the flag football game is that you don't really have to talk to anybody if you don't want to. You can just focus on the game and not have any conversations. So I love that they started there with like this competitive thing where you can get a little bit of frustration out. Like people are enjoying taking the flags off of people that they might have had like a bit of an arch nemesis relationship with without actually getting into a fight or being catty. And then they can go to Tulsi's dinner afterward and like just act like civilized adults. I appreciated that. But one thing I was like, why? You guys, I don't understand. Why was Shelby on a team? I can understand Shelby and Micah going to buy flowers together. Again, if you're meeting up with Irina, I don't know why Shelby needed to be there. Every other person on the show is just meeting up with other castmates. Again, Micah has to have someone latched onto her. That's why I say for an only child, Micah seems to be really dependent 
on others. She seems to be the kind of person that is highly influenced and needs to have a symbiotic relationship with someone. We saw with Irina, we see with Shelby, now we're seeing it with Paul's mom, we see it with Paul. And then when we go to Chelsea's birthday dinner, she's got a whole friend group there with her, telling her, hey, there's Paul, let's go talk to Paul. Like, why did you bring a group of people with you to this event? Like, no one else did that. I just think that Micah has a really hard time functioning solo. And to me, when I see people struggling like that to do things on their own, it usually indicates some form of self-loathing. Being your own company is uncomfortable. You know, these are the kind of people who they have to have music loud if they're in the car by themselves, you know, basically quieting your thoughts. Going to bed at night sometimes can be really stressful or anxiety provoking because you're sitting there with your own thoughts. You get easily bored on your own. And I would just think that as an only child, Micah would have a little bit more experience with that, but she definitely seems to be pretty codependent with Shelby. Micah could probably do well to take the challenge of showing up to some of these things by herself. She might surprise herself with her ability to be okay and actually connect with people without having a buffer. Okay, so now let's move on to the final episode of After the Altar, which is episode three. So with the flag football game, again, I loved seeing Bliss be so mature. She's laughing with Irina, Irina's laughing as well. And I was gonna say Bliss is being so mature, but I was like, well, let me update that to Irina is being mature as well. I do think that this is just a part of Bliss's character. We've seen her handle herself maturely in several contexts and that's new for Irina, so it's hard for me to credit it to her but to be fair you know it only takes one person to ruin a party so I thought they both handled being on the field playing on the same team very well and handled it in stride I love to see that I know a lot of you guys like to watch the show for drama I'm not judging you for that but I think because my life literally is dedicated to helping people sort through their drama I appreciate an opportunity to just see things actually working out well and people acting like adults. That is something that I can appreciate and enjoy watching. I don't need the drama, but my favorite thing is to see people working past their insecurities and communicating effectively and being vulnerable, even though that's not easy to do. That for me is enough plot that I can enjoy watching. Now you compare that situation with Bliss and Irina, to the situation with Chelsea and Micah. What was that conversation? It was such a, to me, I can only go based on how I felt watching it. And so much of therapy is therapeutic intuition or clinical intuition, which is I have to just go based on how things make me feel. Transference and countertransference. I'm not gonna go too deeply into these terms because I know sometimes like I can nerd out on you guys but counter transference is just how does the client make you feel with transference your client might view you as like a maternal figure for example and maybe you trigger them because they have a difficult relationship with their mom and you remind them of that that's what we call transference counter transference is how does the client make you feel for a therapist if there's ever certain sessions that they're dreading going to for example it's good to talk with your colleagues and understand what is the source of your counter transference. Why are you feeling triggered by this client or their situation? And that's a great way to learn a lot about yourself. That's why I love therapy is because I'm constantly growing through the work with my clients, just as they're growing through our work as well. I think it's a very mutual process. But the counter transference that I would experience if I was watching Chelsea and Micah have this conversation on my couch, it just felt very false. Now, I will say one thing about Chelsea, when it comes to the relationships with the girls, she seems to be very, very sincere in that even when they were in the pod situation, I remember her just telling, I can't remember if it was Micah or Irina, and Chelsea was like, why can't you just be nicer? Why can't you be? I think she's the kind of person that is definitely very firm in how she sees things and communicates it, but she's also able to be loving and open. I don't think Chelsea is a fake person. I just think this is a very unique scenario for her in front of the cameras and she's really aware, especially with her and Kwame. I think she's trying to protect their image as a couple, which who wouldn't? You don't usually film you and your partner fighting and then post that on social media. Most of the time we don't. You are also protecting the image of you and the relationships that you hold most closely. But I think because she doesn't have that mindset of protection when it comes to these other girls, you see the raw nitty gritty reaction. And I love to see that. <laughs> the thing about Micah, she uses compliments a lot of times as currency. So she's trying to buy your approval by trying to boost you up and just tell you all these great things about 
about yourself. She's probably just really unsure of herself and so she doesn't know how to make people like her outside of doing things like that. But there are better ways I think to connect with people than to just throw out a lot of positive things at them and hope that, that wins them over. So she's telling Chelsea how much she admires her and respects her. Of course, a lot of us who watched the way that she was flirting with Chelsea's fiance, that's not what admiration looks like. Micah probably does see a lot in Chelsea that she wishes that she had, but I don't know if that moment I would say was like a genuine moment of vulnerability or if it was a strategic way of trying to save your face in front of the world looking at you as like a backstabbing person. What I love about Chelsea's response is that Chelsea is not ignoring her. She's like, oh, thank you, you know, but she is definitely not trying to meet her compliment for compliment. And sometimes we feel the pressure to do that. Like if someone's being nice to me, I owe them niceness back. And there's a difference between being nice and being kind. And, you know, I think sometimes those pleasantries and compliments can feel false if they're done with an agenda. And I think Irina and Michael are just like on an apology tour with this after the altar and the reunion. And it's like, what do you want? What would be better for me? That they act as though they didn't do anything wrong or that they try to take some accountability. They're trying to take some accountability. Unfortunately, they may never have an opportunity to fully repair their reputations. They may never have that opportunity. Maybe they are doing a lot of work. Maybe they have fixed themselves. But one thing I really like that Irina said is she's not dating right now because she's not the person that she would want to date. And I was like, now I think that is a lot of self-awareness. Now, Micah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure what Micah's character arc is going to look like long term. All I've really been seeing her do is cry and in some ways kind of making excuses, saying I wasn't even thinking about other people's perspectives. And so I don't know. But the conversation between Micah and Chelsea See, that conversation was really uncomfortable. And I think Chelsea was, the way that she responded by telling her, okay, so you move back here? I don't think your person is here. <laughs> Savage. She said, I don't think your person is here. You just need to go. And Micah's like laughing along with it, but she's not an idiot. I'm sure she knew what Chelsea was saying, but I can also understand if Chelsea views Micah as a threat, she doesn't want her nearby. But also if you view her as a threat, then you need to be looking at your husband and not worried about her because he should be the person that is making sure that those lines are not being crossed. And we know he was not doing a good job of that when you all were engaged. And Chelsea did hold him accountable for that. So I think she's being fair. I don't think she's interested in being in a kumbaya circle with Micah and I can respect that. Then we fast forward to Kwame playing the flag football game and he took the flag from Paul and he's sitting there next to Chelsea being like, as soon as I see Paul on me, I'm like, well. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so you're still mad at Paul. He wasn't a threat to the woman you're with now. He was a threat to another woman that you're not with that you claim you were gonna break up with anyway. And Chelsea's like, this is about to be a touch. Nice. Line. You know be what nice. I'm saying? Look, it is be what nice. it is. I still don't understand their dynamic and like how can you be so comfortable that he's still so frustrated about the fact that Micah chose Paul over him. If my partner was still so upset that another man got some other woman, I would not be like key keying with him about that. I do not understand that. Maybe they just really have developed such a friendship where she could just sit with him in that. So let's talk about the conversation between Marshall and Jackie. I actually thought that that conversation was more wholesome than I thought it was going to be just because of Jackie. You just don't ever know what you're going to get with her. And so we've seen times where Marshall's apologizing to Jackie in situations where I'm like, why did he need to apologize? And she's just taking it in like she was entitled to that apology. So Marshall, I loved what he said. He's basically saying, I was so focused on keeping you that I did not just let the relationship run its course. Like we were at the end of the relationship and I was still pushing. And I think that's fair. And they're in a unique experiment where the whole goal is the finish line of having a wedding. But I think ultimately, it wouldn't have felt better for them to make it all the way up to the altar. And she knew weeks before she was never gonna say yes and then say no and he's embarrassed at the altar. Unless that's what Marshall is saying because he's acting like he was cheated out of the experiment. But I don't think however many weeks they had left was going to make Jackie say yes. And if she did, I wouldn't trust that it was gonna stay a yes, even if they did get married. So I think him realizing that 
he was more focused on the experiment and getting to the finish line than the health of the relationship. I think that was a good apology. Then I was really happy to hear Jackie say that he deserved better in the breakup. Like the breakup was messy. Absolutely. Cause I think, like I said, I can understand you breaking up with him if he's just not the person, but the whole situation was messy. And that was very embarrassing for him. And she held no empathy for him. She was very callous about the whole situation. She dogged him on the reunion, and I just thought that the whole situation was handled so carelessly. Is this apology enough to excuse those behaviors? No, but an apology is a gift to the person who's receiving it. If that's all Marshall needs to move on and heal from that process, then hey, that's all I would need too, right? Like I can't say, oh, you can't forgive her for that because forgiveness is probably what's going to free him from that situation altogether so he can focus on his new relationship. I was just happy to hear that Jackie was able to see her part in it in some way that actually warmed my heart i just didn't want to see another situation where marshall is just accepting the role of being the bad guy or just the simp guy i know a lot of people probably have a lot of negative things to say about that conversation i was getting triggered when jackie was making some of her faces at the beginning but i thought all in all that's the best you can ask for from an ex you guys really don't owe each other anything at this point so to both have that apology and it be so healthy and wholesome. If that was happening in my session, I would walk out that day and feel like that was a really productive session. All right, now we got one more apology coming from Irina or Micah, where Irina is apologizing now to Amber for laughing at her pain after Paul broke up with her. And again, these people are not giving Micah and Irina a pass, and I'm okay with that. We have the phrase, act now, apologize later. And a lot of people have that mentality that an apology can just fix everything. Everything. An apology is an offering and it's up to the person who's receiving the apology to accept it or not. Micah and Irina apologize in a way where you can tell they're waiting for the person to say it's okay. That's what they're waiting on. They're waiting for someone to validate them and say, even though you treated me like crap, you embarrassed me, it's okay, all is forgiven. And no one is giving them that, not even Bliss. Even at the reunion, Bliss didn't give them that. Everyone is telling them, I am not mad at you, but I need you to be better. And that's actually a kindness because they're saying, if I give you the it's okay right now, you're going to think that this was not a big deal when it was. And I'm not going to give you an easy way out by just letting you apologize to fix everything. You need to actually work on yourself and be better for the people around you. Again, I'm actually happy that Irina and Micah are trying to do something. Y'all know how I feel about some of the previous casts and how they don't have self-awareness. They double down on every choice that they made and justify it. Micah and Irina are at least not doing that, but I do respect their other castmates for not just letting them off the hook so easily and actually challenging them to work on themselves. I think again, for Micah, the best thing she can do is learn how to enjoy her own company and not constantly need buffers around her in order to feel comfortable. Now we are going to have to end talking about, again, a random triangle of people who were barely on the show, which is Monica, Josh, and Jackie triangle. Like, if you've been watching my Twilight breakdowns, then you know I have a pet peeve for love triangles. Cause usually they always end up with the person that I think is not the good fit. I like it when you can be like a nice, stable, consistent person and the good guy's not constantly finishing last, which is typically what happens with love triangles, both in real life and in fiction. How many triangles can Jackie and Josh be a part of? Oh my goodness. You got the Jackie Josh Marshall triangle. You got the Marshall, Jackie, Keisha triangle. Now you got the Monica, Jackie, Josh triangle. Like, oh my gosh, who do you want to be with? For me, that's a very frustrating thing to see. But again, we're being met with some random drama at the very end of After the Altar even. We don't even get three episodes to unpack this. So apparently Jackie and Monica are best friends. Apparently Monica and Josh got engaged. Like what? This is all new information. And in the last five to 10 minutes of this episode, we're supposed to be able to get all the information we need. So obviously my analysis is gonna be a little off because I don't even know who Monica is. I can tell you how this affects the analysis. So my first introduction to Monica, we don't even meet her. Our first introduction to her is Keisha telling Jackie that Monica is coming. 
Apparently they're both part of the core four. Again, a friend group we never even saw. I don't even know who the fourth person is. So Jackie's like, we're about to leave. When Keisha tells her that Monica is coming. And I'm like, oh my gosh, who's this Monica person? At that point, I'm like, okay, Keisha doesn't seem to have a problem with her, but Jackie does. I don't fully trust Jackie's assessment of people. So I'm still neutral. Then we see Jackie tell Josh that Monica's coming. And Josh is like, oh heck no. Now, I definitely don't trust Josh's assessment of people. So I'm like, okay, is this a person that I would have been rooting for? Like, who is this? Then we see the whole proposal with them and when he keeps throwing out all of those jokes, even when I was watching his interactions with Jackie in the earlier episodes of After the Altar, when he keeps saying things like, keep acting right, this all can be yours. He said that joke three times. I don't find that funny as if I need to keep earning your love or something but I see in the engagement when Monica meets him right away she's like oh my gosh I'm engaged to a lunatic now lunatic is obviously a very mean word to say but I mean basically she's saying this is not what I thought this was not the moment I'm meeting the love of my life like I thought it was going to be and I'm not sure how she ended it but it seems like they ended it before they ever even went on the trip to Mexico again I respect that like she's like okay I just don't want this then we meet Monica and she's talking to Jackie and she seems super sincere about wanting her relationship with Jackie she's like I'm here to fight for our friendship I don't know what I did wrong. I sent you the TikToks I was going to do two days before I ever posted them. To me, that sounds like you were doing your due diligence and making sure they weren't blindsided about it. And then Jackie's like saying in her confessional, I'm gonna stick by my man. I'm like, okay, well you weren't sticking by Marshall when he was your man, you were sticking by another man, but okay, that's another conversation for another day. As Monica's talking with Jackie, I'm like, okay, well, she seems to be like really sincere about this friendship. And then she says to her, well, can you get Josh? Cause I don't feel comfortable talking with him one-on-one. -on -one. And I would prefer you get him so we can all just talk about it together. Cause I really don't understand what happened. I haven't been reaching out to blogs about Josh. And then when Josh comes over, she's immediately like cutting him off. Now it could be editing. Maybe they cut out parts of the conversation where he was talking and now she's talking and he's cutting her off. I don't know, but it looked like he came over and started talking and she's immediately cutting him off with everything that he said. So I'm like, why did you ask her to get him if you were just gonna cut him off every time he has something to say? So then I'm looking at her like, okay, so who's the immature one here? Is it you or is it Josh? I can't tell. And I still will never be able to tell. Why? Because we met her in the last five to 10 minutes of the episode and that's all I can say. I have absolutely no insight on Monica because we didn't get to meet her. I don't know if she's been contacting blogs. I don't know how she was treating the other girls in the pods. We have nothing. So all I can say with that situation is it seems like we're dealing with three immature people. That's what it looked like to me. Poor communicators trying to navigate a difficult situation. And my guess is that with those three people, we're probably going to be seeing the same thing happening over and over again if they are to stay in contact. And what I do love again with Chelsea is when Josh tries to come in there and start venting about the situation, Chelsea's like, don't accuse somebody of being a clout chaser. She's like, you got the girl you want. But I'm like, how are you so confident to tell him he got the girl that he wants so he should move on, yet you're allowing Kwame to be still mad at Paul? I thought Kwame got the girl he wanted too. But okay, again, that's another conversation for another day. I'm gonna end this on something positive. Obviously, I still love Brett and Tiff. I think their relationship is something that I would hope that we can see for future Love is Blind couples. I hope they set the benchmark of, you know, this is what healthy communication looks like. And I hope it also encourages the producers to bring on people in their mid 30s more often a lot of the cast is so young i mean irena even says that like i'm so young at a certain point you can go either way on marriage and i rather focus on the people who have tried everything and they still never found their person so that they are clearer on what they want i love bliss and zach you know they're quirky do they make me cringe a bit of course they do but I know that my husband and I make people cringe because we're also very corny and cheesy. So I can hold space for it and just appreciate that they found someone they can be cheesy and corny with. And Chelsea and Kwame, again, we'll see what happens with them. But 
so far they seem to be happy with their dynamic I just think on camera it doesn't come across as super genuine or sincere for me. Okay you guys, those are all of my thoughts on the three episodes of After the Altar. Again, I will be breaking down the new season of Love is Blind, but you guys did tell me in a poll that you prefer when I watch the whole season and then do a breakdown by couple instead of doing reactions episode by episode. So what does that tell you? We're gonna have a little bit of a wait on those videos because I've gotta wait for everything to be put out first before I can put them out. So just be patient with me, make sure you're subscribed put on your bell notification so that you know and for now I'm gonna probably be just continuing with my Twilight series we're about to move on to Breaking Dawn part one and part two next I compare it to the books and we just break down the relationship dynamics diagnoses and everything so if you're interested in that I'd love to see you in those live premieres but thank you for watching this video I ask that you like this video subscribe to my channel and if you're in the live premiere with me thank you so much for chatting with me I absolutely love being able to talk live with you guys and thank you for watching all the way until the end you didn't have to but the fact that you did helps me out so much so thank you thank you thank you